Welcome to another edition of the It's Cavalier podcast. It's your boy, Mag. And today, we've got Jackson Frank of Basketball Insiders in the house. What's going on, my brother? Doing well. How are you? I'm good, man. I'm good. We have a... <laughs> the Cavaliers are going through quite a rough <laughs> patch right now with some of these injuries that have surfaced. Uh, Donovan Mitchell's nasal fracture being the latest with some unfortunate luck with Tristan Thompson coming back and an in, uh, inadvertent elbow really getting him. So kind of sucks. Uh, he'll be resting tonight against the Indiana Pacers, but uh, hoping that he can return to full strength for this uh, playoff run because we are all really, really hoping to see this Cavaliers team make a deep one after last year's just atrocity of a showing in the playoffs. But I'm not going to harp too much on the bad stuff. I do just kind of want to get your thoughts on a couple of things for this season. Um, with that being said, do you believe, just purely based upon the season that the Cavs have had so far, do you believe that the additions that they've made in guys like Max Struess and George Niang have actually paid off for them thus far? Yeah, I, th- I think so. I think the big thing that whenever they do get healthy, you know, assuming it is before the, the playoffs, uh, the big thing is just really continuing to stagger those two centers, right? I think they've looked their best uh, this year right before the All-Star break when Mobley was still in minutes limit. And they basically were playing Mobley and Allen like in five minutes, a couple five minutes stints together. Um, and then basically, you know, separating their minutes because Mobley was still in a minutes restriction. And then things got a little clunkier once Mobley was fully healthy again and they were playing a lot together. But uh, yeah, I think I think they've looked good. You know, Dean Wade's had a resurgent year for the most part um, as well. He's been healthier. Um, Niang's been, I know he's been kind of up and down at times, but uh, clearly that spacing at the four helps them. Struis has been a really nice addition as kind of that third slash fourth ball handler alongside Karras who can also space the floor. I know the, the jumper hasn't always been as good as many people have liked, but the playmaking, the sheer like gravity that he commands as a high volume shooter uh, who can you know take shots on the move is, is a huge benefit. So uh, yeah, I think they're definitely in a, in a better place. It's just a matter of you know, you can JB and company, you know, handle the minutes well, because they do have a lot of defense first, um, you know, non shooting players. No, Mobley shot the ball went better. Uh, as of late, but he's still not a guy that teams are going to, you know, sell out to stop from there, especially with the way that, you know, Jared Allen's a good pick and roll finisher, you know, John Lynch likes to get downhill, things like that. So, uh, yeah, I think they're, you know, the additions have helped a lot. It's just, it's tough to say kind of, is it going to take them to a different level than where they were last year? I think, I think a lot of that just depends on how, how they handle and stagger kind of some of that, that center duo they have. It's a very good duo, but maybe not always the most conducive to, High level offense, and and that kind of brings me to my next question here. I know you've already spoken about it a little bit, but you know one of the big things that's on the collective consciousnesses of uh, Cavs fans, both last year and this year, is whether or not the front court pairing of Mobley and Allen actually works like long term. Like we know, like on their own, they are phenomenal on their own right, and are defensive monsters. With Mobley being a finalist for Defensive Player of the Year last season, and Allen probably going to be up there in the talks for all defensive team this year not quite sure if he'll get those honors but i know he's been a very very good defender this year Uh, but together it can be hit and miss due to those spacing concerns which leads them to that staggering oftentimes that you're referring to Um, i am of the belief that they can work long term given the added spacing of a guy like Struess out there at the three and mobley as you pointed to already kind of showing a semblance of a three-point stroke but there are times when the team seems to function more smoothly, more fluidly, when one of the other is sitting with Dean Wade, spelling either or. Um, we've saw that we saw that a lot this season with Mobley taking his sabbatical due to the knee injury. But um, I guess my overall question for you is: Do you buy into the idea that Mobley and Allen can coexist long term? For me, I think based on the sample we have dating back last year and just how the, the team has looked overall with 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 one versus two on the floor it's hard for me to say that's like the best investment um and, and it's tough too because you know out in their first year that alan was tremendous obviously mobley was good for rookie but alan was tremendous made the all-star game uh second year mobley you think you saw some big strides offensively and, obviously, and clearly you know he asserted himself as a premier defender right uh and then in this this year you know i'd say this pendulum was kind of swung a little bit back to alan being the the better of the two, but Mobley's, you know, still a really, really promising young player, still already a very good player. Um, so it's, I don't know exactly how they go about it, but it's tough for me just based on what we've seen to, to, to say that they can work as, you know, I, I would say, can they be maximized together? It's tough for me to see that. 
Um, but I think, you know, in the short term right now, like I said, it's just about staggering them. You can get away with it because that defense is still pretty dang good when those two are out there. Um, you know, Struthing thing has been pretty solid. I think they're like, when they're at their, you know, when they have a normal starting five with, you know, DG and Mitchell and then Struess plus the two big men, like that defense is pretty good. Like there's not really a, you know, there's a weak link and it's Garland, but I think Garland's proven to be like a pretty capable backcourt defender, um, especially given his size. So um, I think, you know, at least in this season, it's just about like, can you just do enough to win those 10, 12 minutes they play together, especially in a playoff setting, and then just kind of roll like teams when, you know, when you get to a little more of the stagger of the bench because their bench is pretty good this year. Big improvement over last year. I think that wing depth has taken <laughs> yeah, a, a major yeah. step major step forward last year when they were relying on like Danny Green post ACL surgery, Chetty Osmond to do some stuff. And Chetty's a fine player, but when that's your primary kind of true wing off the bench, uh, I think you're in a tough spot. So uh, I'm a little more dubious of them together long term, but um, I do think there's clear ways to make it work uh, as long as they're together. But uh, yeah, they're in, they're in a weird spot, especially with Mitchell being you know up for a you know up for a new deal this summer and, and Allen being quite good in his own regard and you know how long do you want to kind of acquiesce uh you know Mobley's development if you want to at all like do you just kind of say you're already really good and we just <laughs> figure it out or do we maybe you know you know play a little slower but then it's like why did you invest all this in Mitchell so uh, a lot of questions with an answer but I don't think that means they can't be really good um even if they're not maximized I think that speaks to the level of talent those those four plus a Struis plus an Aquaro. Um, I think that's a really nice core six, um, you know, over the next few years or, or however long, you know, that group stays together. I think it's a really nice foundation, even if it's not maximized to the the utmost degree. I think that's totally fair. Um, there are a lot of questions. We, we know that the addition of Mitchell did kind of play a role in stunting the growth and development of Emily just purely based upon the amount of touches that Mobley lost out on potentially having once uh, Mitchell came to town. But so many different questions in that regard. This is a problem that JB has to eventually figure out, you know, in regards to staggering and trying to maximize on the potential and what each and every one of these guys in that starting lineup brings to the table. Um, one of the names that you mentioned, Darius Garland, uh, he, he has had quite – the tale of two seasons in my opinion and he's faced constant criticism this year he's been through the ringer um he, pre all-star break he had a stretch of games of 20 uh, 29 games garland was struggling putting up 18.2 points and 5.9 assists while shooting 47.1 percent from the floor including a pretty lowly 33.1 percent from three-point distance and then post all-star break He's up to 20.1 points and seven assists while completing 43.7% of his field goals, including a very, very good 45% of his triples. With the best part of that being that the man has basically you know, doubled his volume to a near league leading level. Uh, his 54 May triples lead the NBA during that stretch, and his 8.6 three point attempts per game are the 12th most, if I'm not mistaken, as of recording this uh, league wide post All Star break. The the volume, basically, in particular, is something that Cleveland fans have been clamoring for for a while, Jackson. All of that being said, the one thing that we rarely see consistently, um, dating all the way back to last year, really, really, is the combined duo of Darius and Donovan Mitchell dominating in the same game. So my question for you, my friend, is what do you believe the key would be to getting both of these guys going at the same time and not just playing it's your turn, it's my turn kind of thing? Yeah, it's tough because I think one of the things that the, the Cavs do really well in offense is, is leverage the the on and off ball ability of, of Garland Mitchell, but it's kind of hard to, to run that at the same time because those are, I mean, especially in the starting line, those are your two primary ball handlers. Um, you can't really run both of them off the ball or you can't run two of them on the ball at the same time. Um, and so that's, that's where it's tough for me. I do think it can work. Uh, I was surprised. I remember I was looking at some numbers because usually like, you know, and I could be off base, but usually they tend to like stagger Mitchell and Allen and then and Garland and Mobley. And I remember the, the, the year before Mitchell and both Garland and Allen were, uh, both all-stars, like they had a really, really nice chemistry in, in, in ball screens together and pick and rolls. And so, you know, and Garland was struggling. I was like, oh, maybe, maybe they should go back to staggering those. But then you look at the numbers and like the Cavs have been much better when they stagger Garland and Mobley and then Allen and Mitchell together um, without the other two on the court. So it's like, how much do you play into that, right? Like, how do you figure that out? Um, but I, but I think like the the big thing is I would probably play Garland a little more on the ball 
um, next to Mitchell. Uh, one, because I think that's how he gets in the rhythm. I don't think it's been a coincidence some of his best games lately. Have been when he's super aggressive, kind of feeling like he yeah. has to take on a bigger load. Uh, it's similar to what happened uh, the year that Sexton went down. He really saw his offensive aggression go up that year. Uh, so it's like almost like he kind of has to be like compelled to do it by like circumstance rather than just naturally within the flow of the game. Uh, because I also think Mitchell's really good at hitting the seams. He's so explosive off the catch. Like you can still I think you can do a little more naturally without running so specifically for Mitchell off the ball. Whereas with Garland, I think you have to be a little more specific, you know, running him off pin downs, running him off off ball screens, something like that to get him going. Whereas Mitchell just seems like a little more natural because of his strength, explosion, and all that kind of gives him an advantage over Garland. So that's what I would try and do. Um, but at the same time, it's hard to necessarily like just just say, let's take the ball out of our all NBA <laughs> caliber guy who we moved mountains for, who's great on the ball as well. Right. Uh, and, we, and we have Garland who's a very good, you know, for the most part, a very good off ball scorer. So I, I get why maybe that hasn't necessarily been the first inclination for, for Bricker staff and company, but that's probably what I would try and do. Um, you know, once Mitchell is back at some point, I know that he said, you know, I had to, I had to take some time off just cause like, he's not where he wants to be after that, the, uh, the PRP injections and all that. And he looked less explosive too. I've only caught, I think I, he only played a couple of games, but I, the one against um, the Pelicans yeah. last week, even though they won, he just looked less dynamic. That game was largely driven by Allen being great and Garland going off um, in his own right. So, yeah, that 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 would be my my short solution would be just to play Garland a little, a little bit more on the ball and let, let Mitchell do his thing as an on-ball creator for the most part when Garland's sitting. But uh, again, I do understand why that's not necessarily that's just the easiest thing to to do because of how good Mitchell is on the ball and how much. Uh, you know, they, they invested in him, you know, a couple of years ago. I mean, that stretch that saw that, uh, they saw Darius and Evan, uh, be out for a considerable portion of time. We saw Donovan elevate his level of play, looking like one of the best combo guards in the league. I mean, his facilitation was just so key in getting the Cavs over that hump and overcoming the injury adversity during that period of time. And, his ability to kind of bend defenses and the driving kick game that he presents that that strength that you just don't see out of Darius Garland and that aggression, honestly, um, mm-hmm. that he always has. He always p- seems to play with it. Darius, he can get to, but is not automatically locked into that as the game starts. Um, it's just hard, man. But I, I do agree. Um, there, there definitely has to be a sorting out from JB in regards to who's going to be off ball, who's going to be on ball a certain per- periods of time, and not just when one of them is off the floor. It's just it's a tough balancing act, I, I suppose. But uh, I do agree with basically everything you just said in that regard. I'm just I'm wondering with Donovan kind of being not really his true self right now, uh, banged up with the after taking that PRP injection and then getting the nasal fracture on top of that. He's just he's just going through the ringer this year. And um, I, I'm really, really wondering if he's just going to sit a, a good portion of games down this latter stretch of the season to try and get himself right heading into the playoffs. Uh, I hope not because I, I really would not like to see the Cavs take a slide here, but uh, it's it's always possible because of the priorities that we have in, in trying to have this playoff run. But man, it's just, uh, I'm so ready to see these guys experience a good game in the same game. We just do <laughs> not see that enough. Um, but like we've seen it from uh, Evan Mobley and, and Jared Allen going off in the same game. Uh, but moving on from that, we have seen several Cavaliers have career seasons this year, whether it be the emergence of sharpshooting wing and Sam Merrill is drilling, uh, drilling a team high 41.2% of his triples, if I'm not mistaken. And Dean Wade becoming one of the league's better defenders. Jared Allen stepping up and look like a fringe all-star once again amidst so many injuries. And then, of course, one of my personal favorites, Isaac Okoro becoming a legitimate 3 and D wing out there um, for solid stretches this season in a contract year. So I, I couldn't love that anymore. Um, with all of that in mind, is there one singular improvement from this crop of players that stands out among the rest of you? I think to me, it, it feels like Okoro. Um, you know, Merrill's been, Merrill was a great shooter at Utah State. I think it, for him, it was just a matter of you know, finding the time, finding the opportunity, right? Because I think shooters such a rhythm-based archetype that you just need to be able to, like, crack the rotation, and that's what he's done. And he's proven to be much more than a shooter. I think it's impressive. He's pretty good positionally, defensively, has some passing chops. You can tell he played a lot. Underrated passer, yeah. Yeah, you can tell he played a lot with the ball in his hands in college and before that, too. That's helped. So, um, but to me, it's a Coro. Um, not just not just the kind of becoming a 40% three guy that, from three guys this year, but um, more comfortable above the break, um, better driver, 
you're seeing him kind of finish. I don't know if his finish number is necessarily better, but like I think his driving numbers are like he's taking like five. I wrote about him a couple months ago, but like uh, he's driving the ball like twice as much as the year prior. Um, he's really good at passing on the move. He's got that pretty nice connection with Jarrett when he drives and teams collapse on him when he kind of tosses a lay down you know, feed to Jarrett for a dunk. Um, that's the biggest thing. I mean, I remember last year in that that playoff series, like the I think the Cavs actually had a positive net rating when you had the two guards, Okoro, and the two bigs out there. Um, partly because Okoro was pretty dang good defending Jalen Brunson last year in that first round, but the offense was just so clunky just the that spacing, yeah, yeah, that's all it was. that and it's such a small sample too that you can't be like, oh well, JB, you should have like, yeah, you probably should have. You can't like a little bit more time. I don't think you can like. It's not like the most obvious thing, right? Because like there is some sort of like there is just a. You know, I think aesthetics do matter to an extent with that. And the offense, like you said, was just yeah. such a kind of stuck in the middle with the core out there because they were ignoring him. Now it's like it's harder to ignore him because you can play in more places than just the weak side corner. Um, he's not just reliant on the the corner three going in or not. He can drive if they sag off of him. He can play above the break. Um, he's be, he's a really, really good transition player, too. I think that's what I liked about the Cavs this year is they're running a lot more, um, especially since they kind of – since I think Garland Mobley went out their transition – uh, and obviously they come back, but like they're running the ball more. You can tell Mitchell's trying to get the ball out and, and kind of find shooters to get to the rim. And Okoro is great at kind of either leading the break himself when he has space or leaking out and, and taking a pass and using his strength and speed and explosion to kind of get that Euro stuff that he loves around defenders. So um, to me, it's Okoro. I just think he's a much more well-rounded player. And we're going to have to see whether that translates to the playoffs. I think that's always kind of the thing with maybe some of these, these one-year breakouts or shooters, um, especially if, you know, he starts one for 10 from three. Does that affect how he approaches when he his touches and things like that? So yeah, um, the offense is always going to be there or the defense, excuse me, because he's been, you know, I think one of the best wing defenders since he stepped into the league three years ago um, or three and a half years ago now or whatever. Um, but that's been the biggest thing. I think it just gives them, and it gives them options, right? Like if Struz is having a tough game, um, they feel more comfortable, you know, closing with the Coro. Um, to give him a different look, if you know, things like that, you know, if if Mitchell continues to be out, they can close with Struce and Okoro. Um, I don't think the numbers are great this year with both Bigs and Okoro. Last I checked, but uh, point being is that just get like you just now you have two legit starting wings. Uh, whereas last year, I don't think the Cavs had one legit starting wing. I think Okoro was a <laughs> solid player, but he was more of a guy you wanted like being your seventh or eighth man uh, rather than your your best wing. And now this year, I think. You're okay, given kind of how the ro- the roster is made up. You know, leaning into the back court and, and uh, front court a little more than the, or leaning to the centers and the guards more than the wings. You're okay with the Coro being that number one guy. And he's not even the number one wing; he's their second wing behind Struce when Struce is healthy. So, uh, to me, a Coro has been the biggest development there. But uh, yeah, you'd be remiss not to mention Merrill and, uh, and Karras. I think has grown a little bit defensively this year as well. Um, yeah. Str- you know, Struce having to get your weight. It's nice to see him healthy and shooting the ball well. So. Uh, yeah, there's certainly been a lot of uh, growth on the perimeter uh, behind the the star guard, which I think is a really nice uh, component for the Cavs to have going into the spring and the playoffs. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you could even make a case for Jared Allen and uh, Donovan Mitchell, honestly, having career years in their own right in, in many aspects. And uh, with that being said, bringing up Donovan Mitchell – uh, he may be, in fact, having that best season of his career on his way to averages of 27.4 points, 5.3 boards, 6.1 assists, uh, and a career-best 1.8 steals, which actually ranks fourth in NBA, last time I checked. Um, he, he was the focal point of that Cavaliers stretch. This saw him go a NBA-best 23-5, and five, including two separate eight-plus game winning streaks, which was phenomenal. Had the whole uh, ha- Had the whole NBA talking for a period of time. Uh, However, despite all of that, Mitchell has recently joined a list of players that has been declared ineligible for all NBA and and a slew of other awards because he would not finish with more than the 65 game rule uh, indicates. Uh, He he can't finish with any more than I believe now 63 games after tonight's miss. Uh, That sucks in my opinion, but at the end of the day, it's not the end of the world, Uh, but it it's because it's not like he was eligible for the super max anyway. But um, with all that being said, do you believe the NBA should adjust the number of games that makes a player eligible for awards and nominations like this? I just don't think that it, 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 it seemed to address a problem that didn't really exist. Uh, one, like MVP, like MVP winners never get the award if they play, you know, usually for the most part, less than 65. I think Embiid might've played 64 last year or something, but um, it wasn't like he played 15 fewer than Jokic or right. I think Giannis was the other finalist. Um, 
it just felt like we're addressing something that wasn't really an issue to me. Um, and the, the, to me, the reality too, is that like, you can be an all NBA caliber guy, you know, second or third team and play 58, 55, 50 games. Like there, it's just, if you're a top 10 to 12 guy, I would say Mitchell's like a top 15 ish guy. Um, like you're probably just going to impact the game more in the 59 games you play than the 39th best player who happens to play 73. And that's not a knock on, on that person. Like there is clear like benefit to be able to suit up for your team every night. But like these guys aren't resting because they don't want to play. They're either resting because they're injured or it's a second of a back to back or a third game of four nights. And they're, they got, you know, they, they have a bad, like they're, they rolled their ankle and they, you know, they need a night off and things like that. So it just felt like addressing a problem doesn't exist. And I do think it is a bummer that, you know, the type of season Mitchell's had uh, and the way that he's kind of helped, I don't want to say like he's carried the team on his own. Obviously, because of the depth and the coaching and Jared Allen's been huge. Um, but the That's way okay, he's led, I'll say it for you. <laughs> but the way he's led them in, amid tumultuous circumstances to not even be recognized with an All NBA appearance, assuming he you know plays at least ten to twelve more games. Obviously, forty eight is kind of a you know, I think it's at right now is a tough tough place to end at. But I don't think he'll end there most likely. But to have only you know an All Star you know uh, birth to his name for the season tab, I don't think is quite fair um either so yeah i just i don't like the cutoff at all i just i just feel like it was solving a problem that like we didn't really have like Embiid was having a great year let's say he doesn't even injure his knee but he ends up playing 59 61 games and Jokic and Doncic and sga and, and Giannis plays 73 or 78 or whatever like nobody's gonna give him the award even if he was a, a little better player right so it just it just felt like addressing them and it wasn't really an issue and i i remember Ka- they've asked Kawhi a lot about it a lot because he's played a lot this year and he's like right. i'm just healthy like i was injured before like, <laughs> like, like I, I don't think i don't think everyone understood like that's I wasn't the most why response yeah. ever too like, yeah like, i don't have a torn meniscus or a torn acl or or whatever it is so yeah i the, the cutoff at all and i think a lot of the pushback has been like oh people have to play a game like oh nba players have to play they want to play like it's not it's not like they're like they don't want to just collect a check yeah. and sit down yeah, yeah. these maybe guys are competitive are, maybe there are some guys like that in the nba who you know aren't necessarily as to do, but like those guys aren't the ones up for awards so it doesn't it doesn't really feel like an issue so yeah to me it's a bummer for guys like him and um there's a lot of who Kyrie's there's, a, there's a lot of them, man i'm just looking through the list yeah. here and there's Kyrie irving's up there uh, obviously bradley bill john morant jimmy butler Kristaps Porzingis, Tyrese Halliburton, I believe. Uh, there's a couple of names that, that are is being Halliburton, looked. is he not going to make the cutoff? I know he's kind of been – he's played through that hamstring injury at times. There he is – he's at 55 games right now. You know what? He probably will actually make it. But point being is he, there's definitely been some times where he's played where it looks like he's compromised. I'm not going to say he's playing just to reach the, the that threshold, but – um, but, yeah, you can tell that he's not at 100%. Um, but, yeah, I, it's just – it's a bummer. I think you, because I think voters are smart enough. Like they already, like they already brought it up or they already included that into their, their process, I think unofficially, right? Like if a guy played 51 games versus a guy played 68 and they are generally kind of held in the same league wide regard, whether it's, you know, on the whole or for that specific season, like the guy who played 18 more games or whatever is usually going to get the nod. Right. So it just felt like addressing a problem that didn't really exist and was already something that the voters uh, accounted for uh, by and large, but is what it is. Um, I just hope that it doesn't like kind of devalue some of these awards and kind of turn them into like survival of the fittest. And that's not to say that players who make all NBA or win the MVP or whatever the, this year aren't going to be deserving, but I just I just hope that we don't look back on this in five years and see some some all NBA teams that aren't necessarily reflective of how this season actually went. I think that is fair to say. I just I always wonder, just from a player perspective, just from a, a pure human aspect in regards to these guys, do they feel slighted? Like, man, I just put together the best season of my career. I've I've done wonderful things this year for my squad, and I'm not getting that recognition. I often wonder how much that plays into the psyche of some players, and some that can affect like deep, the actual contractual situations. Thankfully, that's not the case with Donovan, but it it, it does happen to be the case for some of these guys. And I think I think it is with Halliburton. I think that's partly why he's been playing because I think he just signed his rookie max extension that has yeah. like a fifteen million dollar bonus if he makes All NBA of the year. He signs it, and that that this year, um, so he wants to stay eligible. And you know, uh, I think he'll end up playing sixty five plus and probably make one of these teams. But clearly, he hasn't been at his. He hasn't played with the same sort of like I think uh, dynamic approach as he no. did earlier in the year before the the hamstring injury a few months ago against the Celtics. I think. Um, and we're, that was like in December and we're still talking about it in, in late March. So, um, yeah, you just, you just hope that guys don't feel compelled to, to necessarily have to play through injury because they make a little more money at the end of a contract. So 
Right. Um, we'll right. see what happens. I'm, I'm, you know, I think Halliburton's already spoken out against it. Um, so he doesn't really like it. And I'm sure, you know, more players in the future might feel similarly. And you just hope that that fans and media like listen to them and don't interpret it immediately as though they don't want to play. They, they don't want to show up to work. No, that's nah, you know, that would never happen. <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> the average, the average yeah, uh, Joe on true. the street will say, Oh man, they just, they just want to sit on their ass. Uh, <laughs> but shifting away from that, um, JB Dickerstaff has coached the Cavaliers to a 42 and 25 record, which is good for third in the Eastern conference this season. And it's the NBA sixth best record overall. We know he's de- uh, dealt with a ton of, re- of rotation and roster consistency due to those injuries and has managed to overcome. And despite missing some of his best players for large portions of the season, the Cavs have the third highest defensive rating. It's eighth best net rating. And as long as they stay the course, they'll probably have another top four finish. Uh, with that being said, how much credit do you think you would give JB for the Cavs' success this year? Such an interesting case to me because he really does feel like like less is more for him. Like when he has fewer options at his disposal, he does a better That's job. What everybody maximum. says. And I think it's true, right? Because like I mentioned earlier, like when when Mobley was on a mint restriction, he was forced to play the the bigs together less. And then when Mobley was off the mint restriction, he left the All Star break. He went back to closing with double big lineups and. Uh, they haven't played as, and I know some of it's been some injuries and whatnot, but they haven't played as well or looked as good um, since that's you know, the way they ended that the first half of the season. So um, I think he deserves a significant amount of credit. Uh, I do like a lot of the schemes they've run. I think he's done a really good job to kind of keep things as a collective effort, right, and maximize the spacing and make sure that the guys feel involved, um, keep them engaged. Um, you know, a guy like Dean Wade, Karras, you know, guys who are relied on to an extent for their defense are also getting. You know, Dean Wade's getting his chances to spot up. Harris is getting his ball handling reps. Um, you know, Jared Allen's getting his elbow touches, not just screen and dive to the rim, right? So um, I think he deserves a significant amount of credit. Um, but at the same time, you do wonder, like, what would the Cavs look like if they'd just been healthy all year? Like, would they would they not be jacking up all the three if they decided to start taking, you know, yeah. once Garland Mowley down? Would, would, they, would Dean Wade not have kind of broken out um, and, you know, asserted himself as a key fixture? Would Isaac Okoro maybe not have taken on a, you know, an offensive leap. So um, it's a really tough thing for me to parse. And I don't necessarily know if it's fair to punish him for like a hypothetical reality versus <laughs> yeah. the reality that he's faced. But um, I absolutely think he's done a good job. And, you know, I just you know, hope for the Cavs' sake that he, you know, the wheels kind of start to turn a little more. And, you know, once they get healthy and he can still kind of maximize them because I think that's where he's not necessarily been at his best um, this year. I think some of those undermanned rosters, you know, you think, you know, think back to when Sexton and Rubio went down two years ago, how good they were for the most part until, um, you know, Garland got a little dinged up. And I think maybe they had one or two other small injuries that they just couldn't quite uh, hold on there, uh, how good he was that year and then, you know, this year or so um, when they've been injured. So, yeah, he's been he's been very good. I think he's the guy that um, could at least get some mention for, for Coach of the Year. I don't know necessarily where that's, you know, I think to me, you know, the top three would be something like Dagno, Finch, and, and Jamal Mosley. But uh, if somebody wanted to put bigger stuff over one of them or, you know, at least top five, I think it would be hard to argue against against that uh, definitively. So yeah, he's done a good job. But like I said, it's just, you know, is it is it good enough to lead the Cavs to what I think they could legitimately make each current finals with this roster? You know, at full strength, we'll see. Um, but he's definitely done a good job through 80% of the season. It's been such an odd year for JB. <laughs> and, you know, I kind of feel bad for him in a lot of aspects because – Obviously, when the Cavs have experienced the success, uh, you know, he's not getting a lot of love. And then when they have their failures, they'll everybody's going to point to JB. And that's just the nature of the beast with a position like that. <laughs> and I mean, yeah. it, I mean, that's just it is what it is. And it, what sucks about it is if the Cavs just so happen to flame out this year, he's gone. It, you know, he'll be the first person to be kicked out of the door and. Maybe not even of his own fault, but at the same time, that's just the the, the box that the Cavaliers have kind of been put in, uh, especially after last season's playoff showing. And so there is so much writing on this playoff run for JB and company. Um, but it is, it, it, I would be remiss to not give the man his credit this year, dealing with everything that he's dealt with. It's just, as you said, it's been so funny to watch him kind of be at his best when the chips are down and guys are out and you're having to play with different role players in different spots that they're not used to being in. And you do wonder like, um, would some of these developments and breakouts have occurred if the Cavaliers were at full strength, if some of these guys wouldn't have gotten the level of opportunities that they, that they had been afforded like Sam Merrill, um, who, you know, we, we knew that he could shoot, like you said, coming out of 
uh, Utah State and having some of his period of time with Milwaukee winning the championship there and, you know, just bouncing around a little bit with Memphis and a couple other teams before actually being given a shot this season um, due to all those injuries. Does Okoro get the confidence to pull the trigger like he's had as of late? Does Dean Wade get bumped up into the rotation in the starting unit, filling in for Evan Mobley and, um, again, um, having the confidence to, to, to pull the trigger and go out there and play some of the some of the best defense out on the wings there. But a lot of different questions that probably will not be answered until the playoffs. So I, I will say bigger stuff also is credit because I think he's developed a lot during his time in Cleveland. I remember and granted the personnel has improved, but like I, I really didn't love. I thought the playbook was pretty kind of bland and flat early on in his career here. And I think it's gotten a lot better to the point where there's, they run a lot of stuff that I think is some of the better better actions and ideas in the league. Um, and it's yeah, it's easier when you have a decent amount of shooting and two really good guards and two really good bigs. But um, I think he does a really good job of that and to just really kind of flesh things out. So whether that's, you know, have they hired a different coaching staff? Has he been a little more adaptable and spread his wings more? Whatever it is, I think he's done a good job there. And uh, I also don't think it's a coincidence that, like, you know, they have, you know, you, like they all compete defensively too. I think like I think Mitchell's having his best year defensively of his career. Yeah. Um, Harris Avert had that last year. He, he yeah, had one of his better defensive performances. Yeah, he's he's a guy who I think they all throw on some wings and feel pretty comfortable. Some of those bigger guards, you know, they like him against SGA a lot. Um, you know, I think Garland's become a pretty good defender. You know, since joining the NBA. Um, you know, some of those guys like Dean Wade, he, he was obviously already a pretty good defender. Akoro, that was his whole thing coming out, but. Just want to give JB, you know, some credit for some of the development, the way he's grown his playbook as well. So um, I think we always focus on kind of how players develop, but I think, <laughs> yeah. you know, coaches absolutely develop as well. And, you know, JB, he, I don't know, he only has, what, maybe six years of head coaching experience under his under his belt. Um, I think yeah, the last three have generally been, generally been pretty good. I know when he, he first got the job, he was kind of regarded as, you know, just Bernie Bickerstaff's son who hadn't done much, you know, at Houston. Or, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I hadn't done much in Houston or in Memphis when he got a stint, and I think he's definitely proven to be a, at the very least, a solid NBA coach. Who, if this is the last year, he'll he'll deserve, you know, more chances, you know, as a head coach somewhere. I'm not saying you know we're not writing his tombstone or anything like that, but just a guy who I think we want to make sure, um, you know, is a good solid NBA head coach and um, has really kind of grown the last couple of years, three years during his it was the longest extended run to lead the team. Absolutely. That's I, I feel like that's a point that's not talked about enough is his development just as a as a head coach, uh, because you just don't often think about that as a typical fan. I mean, you've seen just in purely in terms of some of the team related stats that the Cavs have finished in over the past couple of years, having a top 10 offense, top 10 defense last year, floating up there around this season. Um, and then, you know, the the progression in terms of win loss with him, you know, going from 22 to 44 to 51 and then, you know, who knows how many games they're going to end up winning this season, but they're already at 42. Um, that being said, so much again is riding on the playoffs, and I, I I'm really hopeful, but uh, it, it is is definitely with, not without a little bit of uh, cautious anxiety. <laughs> I'll put it that way. Um, yeah. Moving away from the Cavaliers, though, we've kind of talked about them a lot. Um, you've been pretty vocal in your belief in a player like Jalen Williams. And this is one of the things that I saw this thread was just, it was a really, really good thread on, uh, on, on Twitter or X, wh whatever people call it these days. <laughs> um, you, you even went as to far, so far as to call him a top 20 player in this league. And I, I can't lie. Like he, he was really intriguing coming into that draft. I thought he had all the tools to succeed at the next level, the shot creation via isolation or DHO and pick and roll sets. Uh, off ball shot making. He can take teams off the dribble. His length bothers opposing teams defensively. His screen navigation is top notch, in my opinion. It's just a very well rounded young talent. Uh, but with all that being said, one of the things that you said that I found the most interesting was that when you mentioned a player, uh, when you mentioned these types of rankings, you brought into the equation name prestige in reference to some of these rankings. So my question is, when you're thinking about your top rankings, what goes into that process? Like, what do you what do you factor in? Because that, that's a name that a yeah. lot of people probably wouldn't have in their top 20. Yeah, uh, I think, you know, to me, there's only, there's only a handful of guys who I think can really be the primary engine of, of a really good offense or a great team. Um, and that's not for me to discredit, like, I'm not trying to discredit guys who like are put in or miscast the number ones and have to kind of carry some lowly offenses. Talking um, to you, Jordan Poole. 
<laughs> <laughs> but just just the idea, like to me, and I think just what Jalen Williams does so well is like it doesn't really feel like he has any like glaring weaknesses, and he has a bunch of really really standout traits. I think you mentioned basically all of them, right? And people are like, oh, he plays a FSGA, you know, garners a lot of attention. That's true. And OKC has it does have some of the best spacing in the league, but um, he is a guy who's proven this year to have a pretty big knack for taking over fourth quarters. Um, the creation is there. Uh, he likes to pull up going left. He'll drive to the rim all the way, usually going right. Um, has a really nice step back three, uh, good off ball shooter, um, spot up shooter, really good cutter. Um, they'll play him in the dunker spot sometimes and just let him kind of be like almost like their version of Aaron Gordon in the sense that like, you know, if, if they collapse in SGA or whoever it is, we'll feed you the ball and you've got such good length and explosion off the ground that you can just finish over guys. So, um, yeah, it's, I don't know. I just, I try that when I look at it, I just kind of look at like the, if you don't have like a, like a really, really, really valuable collection of like standout traits, like, like what is the kind of your holistic skill set like, and how does that fit on like the most winning teams? Um, and I think you, you, you know, mentioned like, a lot of teams where he could probably go to and instantly be the number one option. Yeah. And I, and, I, and I think, you know, that thing, that one specifically took, got a lot of people uh, up in arms um, <laughs> because, they, you know, they, they, you know, they were saying Laurie Markkinen or Paolo Banchero. And those guys are good. Obviously they're, they're very good players in the round. Right. But like, and Paolo, obviously his, his efficiency wouldn't, would be better in, um, in OKC, but he's not automatically become a 45% shooter. He's not automatically getting like playing much bigger than the size around the rim. Um, he's not automatically becoming like a great vertical leaper. Um, he's not learning how to chase Duncan Robinson around screens like I've seen Jalen Williams do this year. Um, and that, yeah, it's not to say that he might not look better. His impact stats might not be better, things like that. Um, but I, I just think right now, if I was going to pick like who would help OKC win a title right now, it would be Jalen Williams for me. Um, I just think he's a really, really good player. And, um, you know, I think top 20, you know, that's. I kind of right where I had him. I think if you like maybe 22 to 25 might be a little more of a safe ranking um, in my eyes, but I know that like, I don't think really people took exception with the 20 as much as like, if I said anything above 35 to 40, cause that's kind of where he's generally regarded. Um, that's where kind of some of the blowback came, but um, I'm just really, really a big fan of this game. I think he's a guy who, you know, just, you know, I think sometimes we'll like look at wings who are kind of the, the, the master of none, Jack of all, you know, the Evan Turner, yeah. the Jarrett Culver's, these guys um, that don't know. And Evan Turner had a nice, solid career. Jarrett Culver is obviously flamed out, unfortunately, but um, guys don't really have anything they're hanging their hat on. But Jalen Williams has a bunch of stuff to hang his hat on, even if he's not the best shooter in the league. He's not the best driver. He's not the best wing defender in the league. Like, he does all of them at a really high level. And um, I don't think he's just necessarily just propped up um, by extent of, of OKC's great scheme, personnel, and coaching, and, you know, being led by an MVP candidate. So, um, you know, I'd be willing to, you know, say a little lower than 20, but I would, like, I, I think it'd be like, that would, that would, I wouldn't, I'm also not going to back down for 20 either. You know, I think he's right in that kind of that second tier, maybe not quite all NBA caliber right now, but, um, guys that I think are very much all-star caliber. And what's interesting is I think, you know, some of the blowback was like, oh, like top options, but like a lot of the guys that we consider to like in that range already aren't top options, right? Like Paul <laughs> yeah. George, a Bam Adebayo, and and Bam obviously is a top option defensive event to win for right. mentioning, but um, a lot of these guys that you know people didn't necessarily like him being above are already top options. So um, yeah, I understand that he doesn't necessarily have the, the lengthy track record, but he's played like this guy for about a year plus now. Um, I think maybe February, March of last season when he kind of started to be an 18, 19, 20 points per game guy with everything. LC already does well. Um, so, yeah, I'm, you know, we'll see how that ages, but um, I do feel okay. <laughs> I will, you know, maybe he has a terrible playoff run and you know, people continue to make fun of me for it and I'll, I'll, I'll wear it on my face, but I feel pretty comfortable with that take right now. And, um, you know, I do, I think it's just a matter of, uh, to me, like, I just, I just think the biggest thing is his defense isn't fully appreciated enough. And I think his passing is a little underrated too because he doesn't, he doesn't have like the, he's not averaging eight assists a game, but, um, can do stuff from a live dribble. Like I said, he's, he'll lock up on the ball. He'll chase guys off the ball. He'll play low man and protect the rim as a secondary guy if they need to. I feel like um, he's kind of uh, he's kind of displaced Josh Giddy a little bit too. It's like it kind of makes Josh Giddy. Yeah, the, the opportunities are obviously not as flush as they were before he got there. Uh, but I, I kind of feel like he's kind of made Giddy be a little bit less uh functional in that offense i know giddy brings a lot to the table but he just kind of seems out of place at times now with Jalen being there yeah and i i don't know how exactly high he'll 
he'll climb, you know, in in the NBA world, but still only 22, 23, right? I think he did two years at Santa Santa Clara. Yeah, Uh, maybe three. He could be wrong, but um, yeah, I'm really excited for him. And I, you know, I, you know, I guess I've kind of like made my name as the Jalen Williams guy now, which is for good or for better or for worse. But I feel confident in my evaluation there, and I I understand why I got some blowback. But uh, yeah, I think (laughs) the name prestige thing. I think it's just. We're we're slow to anoint guys who don't have a three year four year track record of done it in the playoffs, um, which I understand. But I also think it's okay to be a little more fluid with these rankings. And um, I don't think he's necessarily like I didn't call him a top five guy, right? You know, I don't think right. he's, usurp- <laughs> he's not usurping like generational players right now who are still at the peak of their powers or are dominant playoff players at you know, this stage of their career. So um, yeah, yeah, I, I I just I think the way I evaluate things is. Um, just a, you know, a matter of kind of what, how many high-end skill sets do you have and kind of what can you lean on if your primary one is taken away and, and how can you impact the game um, if that primary skill is taken away. And I think, you know, among non-top 15-ish, top 10 guys, you know, Williams answers that question about as well as you can, just given all the, the versatility he has. He's just so well-rounded. I mean, he, mm-hmm. he, he's a spot-up shooter. He can slash. He's he's very, very underrated defensively in terms of the way that people talk about him. Uh, he, he can just do a lot of different things. So I, I have loved to see him have such a good start to his uh, NBA career. Um, with that being the case, we've seen every single season without fail, someone seems to take some type of proverbial leap, whether that be last season like L- Lowry Market or Jalen Brunson or SGA who are all finalists for the coveted most improved player award with marketing, and obviously taking those honors home this season. We've seen Kobe white uh, seems like kind of a lot for the award with the aforementioned Williams being up there too, Tyrese Maxey, Jonathan Kaminga, all of these guys are worthy mentions in terms of taking that leap. Hell as a Cleveland fan, I've already expressed my love during this episode for Isaac Okoro. I and mean, I, I feel like he kind of belongs in that group. He, he's not going to get the love, obviously, because he's not had the offensive explosion like some of these other guys have had. But point still stands. We've seen guys take leaps every single season. In your eyes, is there a player that hasn't been getting enough love for their development this year that you'd like to see get some more recognition? I think just among the guys you you mentioned, another one I would add would be Jalen Johnson. I know the – the jumpers kind of come back to earth a little bit, That's but um, yeah. he's still pretty efficient, I think. I think he struggled, like I said, the jumper. He was at like 37, 38%. He might have had a little bit of a hand injury or something at one point, but falling back to earth there. But, uh, you know, the stuff he's, he can attack closeouts a little bit too. Um, the transition scoring is really fun. Uh, you're really good pass in the open floor. Can do some stuff on the move there. Uh, I think he is a guy that, you know, the Hawks, you know, Hawks fans, Hawks, Front office, whoever it is, are pretty excited about him over there, despite them having a a pretty lackluster year. Um, I knew that he was going to be. I, I knew that he was taken off once the sports books started adding him to the parlays. <laughs> like once they started adding him to the uh, the uh, accessible parlays option for for Atlanta in the double digit mark, I knew he would. Uh, I knew he was on to big things. <laughs> but yeah, but I think he's the one. You know, he does some really nice stuff. It was like low man for them. Uh, I know their defense is in shambles basically all year, but. Um, he has added a nice dynamic as such, at least some sort of he makes them think at least a little bit when offenses kind of throw a roll man in there and he's on the backside, which they hadn't really had previously. Um, so he would be a guy that I, I would give a shout to. I think for me, Kobe would be Kobe would be my number one pick right now. It I I think I saw that Maxi might be the like the runaway favorite in terms of uh betting odds. That was maybe a week yeah. ago or so. But uh and Maxi I think it's gotten better. Something I, I think his passing's gotten better, his defense, his change of pace. Um, and but I don't going th- out that really, really changed. Yeah, that too. but I don't think he's like taking the biggest leap. Like I think a lot of the statistical stuff would have been there. Like the biggest reason he's like taking a big leap in the box score is because Harden's not there anymore, and he's the point guard now. Um, and again, that's not to discredit him. I just think Kobe's taking a bigger leap. Um, you know, I think I don't know about Kuminga necessarily taking a big bigger leap than Maxi, but I think he's he's just gotten he's, more opportunities. He's gotten more opportunities. He's gotten a little more refined mid-range game this year. That little kind of like eight-foot leaner he likes is, I think, become a lot more sustainable for him. That's an important shot. And I think just kind of the, the general theme of this is like how long it takes for guys who are ball handlers for, or ball skills to develop, right? And so, um, you know, I think it's just, you know, we even mentioned Okoro, and the, the big thing for him, right, is some of those drives, some of that stuff. So, uh, yeah, Jalen Johnson would be the one name I'd add there, but I expect Kobe 
I, I shouldn't say expect him. I, he would be who I would pick up ahead of though. I just think the way he's improved his handle, improved the way he uses screens, his uh, his ability to get to the rim, his, his ability to take contact, um, and they they have put him through the ring. I mean, I don't know where he's at, but like he might have let, been lead the league in minutes. Him and Demar Derozan are like just total workhorses for that Chicago team. Um, who, despite some of their injuries and maybe some of their mediocrity, are actually a pretty fun team to watch because they have guys who go out there and compete every night and they seem to really enjoy being around each, each other. So um, the Bulls have been kind of one of my favorite uh, teams to throw on a league pass on a given night because they usually be competitive. We'll get to see DeMar in the clutch. We'll get to see Kobe White step back three, Ayo Sumu drive. Um, he's another guy I think is taking a big leap in season. Um, just the way Ayo has been able to kind of you know match some of his defensive ability with his versatile driving, he loves playing transition. The jumpers been really good the last couple of months. So, uh, yeah, I think I think Kobe's my favorite for the pick or for that award. But Jalen Johnson's a guy that I don't think should be uh, slept on in the conversation. Certainly, yeah. As you were saying all that, I was just looking it up, and it's crazy enough. Uh, Demar Derozan and and Kobe White are actually the NBA's leader in total minutes overall. Demar has twenty four eighty seven, and then Kobe at twenty four twenty five. So they're they are playing a ton of minutes, and then uh, Kobe's development definitely shows. Uh, so I'm I'm glad that he's getting that recognition. Uh, before I let you go here, man, I do have one more question for you, and that is. Uh, before I get to it, let me preface it by saying this. We've seen so many great player podcasts appear uh, just more and more regularly lately, whether it's Gills Arena or Podcast P or the Draymond Green Show or the Old Man 3. We're just seeing a lot of different perspectives these days. Um, everybody truly has a podcast now, <laughs> even guys you wouldn't normally think. And uh, with that being said, a new one was announced today in Mind the Game, which is a joint venture between J.J. Redick and LeBron James, uh, which I'm very, very interested to see because anytime those guys are talking ball, I'm, I'm there with the level of knowledge that is there. Um, is there a particular show that kind of stands above the rest to you? And uh, what's your go-to? Or are you even a podcast guy? I'm not as much of a podcast guy as I want to be because my issue is like I'm not great at multitasking. So when I listen to one, I'll just like zone out on the task I'm actually <laughs> focusing on. And then I'll be like, I didn't absorb any of that. Um, but the snippets of the times I do listen, I think I think Old Man the Three um, are, is really good for di- like X's nose breakdowns. Um, the dunker spot with Steve Jones, Zacchaeus Duncan is great for that as well. Yeah. Um, all city is doing one with Adam Martes and Tim Legler. I think they're really good. I think Legler, you know, uh, as I've been, always been really, really good at X's nose for ESPN. He will teach you um, the game of basketball. That's yeah. For sure. Yeah. And I think he just breaks it down and they all, I think they both do. And I think, um, you know, I, I think they just bring nice perspectives there. And then, uh, I like the way that Paul George's podcast gets players to open up. He seems to be a guy who's just super easy to let like, players for to relate with. I think he gets a lot of great stories on there. Um, I, so that would say those are kind of the four that, you know, three of them are four, a little, maybe a little, three of them are a little more like X's and O's is what's happening in the state of the league. And then uh, Paul George is a little more like, you know, shooting, shooting the shit with players and get it, that kind of breaking down the, the wall between players and, and fans and media that we see a lot of times when they put their guard up. So um, yeah, those are some of the, the ones that stand out to me. And I think they all do a good job in different ways. And uh, I think, you know, obviously Reddick has players on a lot too, but I think where he differs from, from Paul George, and I could be wrong to an extent um, because I'm not, you know, I'm not listening to them all the time, but I think like Reddick will kind of get you to them to like discuss the minutia of how they set up a pick and roll or what they, what they see as a defender on the weak side. Whereas Paul George is kind of, you know, just having them tell stories about maybe a teammate they shared or a coach Coach or they LeBron shared. nominate. <laughs> yeah, that was a good one. A shared experience, I guess, would be the best way to put it. But uh-huh. um, those those are the four that I think you know stand out the most to me. Which so Dunker Spot, I think it's, I think All City NBA Show is what it's called with with Legler and and Adam Martas, um, and then Old Man of the Three, and then what's I don't know what's is Paul is Paul George just called Podcast B. Yeah, I believe that's the name of the yeah. podcast officially. Okay, yep. cool. Yeah, um, they all do a good job. I'm sure those are the ones that I'm missing. But again, I'm I'm not the encyclopedia of podcast knowledge that I wish <laughs> I could necessarily. Uh, oh, I, could man, be here for, I, was, I could be here for, for minutes and hours. Shout, shout out to man if I was, but I am not. I, I appreciate the honesty in that regard. But your points are spot on, though. I mean, if you want X's and O's, you know which podcasts to go to. If you want to hear a player perspective in regards to what it's like to face a specific player, you know, that podcast P is definitely the one for that one. X's and O's stuff. 
um, the Tim Legler show and uh, Old Man in the Three, they're definitely up there in regards to X's and O's. So if anybody's learn, anybody's interested in learning like specific concepts and different types of play calls uh, in, in regards to basketball, those are definitely some of your options that you have. But I'm really, really interested to, to, to see this new joint venture between JJ and LeBron because that little snippet, I don't know if you got to see it, but the snippet they showed today just – just showed you that uh, they're going to be breaking the game down at a whole new level. So we'll see. Uh, but Jackson, man, thank you so much for, for coming on the show. I definitely appreciate it. Yeah. Happy to talk ball uh, anytime. Appreciate you having me on and uh, you know, hopefully the, the Cavs can get healthy here for you and uh, <laughs> you get, you get a little uh, stability entering the playoffs. Oh, for sure, man. I, I really hope that's the case. You guys make sure to check out Jackson's work on basketball insiders. Uh, he's done phenomenal work over there. That being said, as I always tell you guys, if you'd like to reach out to him, you know how you can. It's Cavalier underscore pod on Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, and more. If you'd like to be added to the It's Cavalier Discord chat, you know what to do. Leave a rating, leave a review, send a screenshot, set a review to It's Cavalier 53 at gmail.com, and I will send you an invite. Jackson, I say that every episode, and I, I almost mess it up every episode, so it feels good <laughs> when I don't do that. <laughs> that said, uh, go Cavs, and you guys have a good night.